Madam Engman, ladies and gentlemen, captains and crew of Bellingshausen. Uh, I grew up in the eastern suburbs of Gothenburg, far from har the harbor here. But I remember well how I, I, in the beginning of the 1950s, some 60 years ago or more, was taken along several times to the Amerika Kajen, here to wave farewell with a white handkerchief to relatives and friends of the family, Estonians, all of them. They were leaving us. They were leaving Sweden for America or Canada. In those days, our harbor was a rattling and clattering place with smaller ships dashing hither and thither across the river, tugboats whistling and moaning, the big freighters resting heavily along the quays, huge cranes and sullen big blue were working men all over the place. The world famous Gothenburg shipyards and shipping companies were still on top, boosting the reputation of Gothenburg as the number one seaport of Sweden. It was a strange and fascinating world for a suburban kid. But at the same time, the Estonian community in Sweden was bleeding. We had all arrived in 1944 and just established ourselves with congregations, newspapers, publishing houses, schools, summer camps, folk dance groups, choirs all over the country. We had even central organizations and uh, had organized a great dance and song festival in Stockholm. But now, around 1950, we were bleeding because every fifth Estonian, that is about 5,000 persons out of some 25,000, left Sweden around 1950. And they all, and this is my point, departed via the port of Gothenburg. My second prelude is historical. Of course, you all know what connects Gothenburg with New York and Jakarta. New York, Jakarta. Their common denominator is Amsterdam. Its canals, its seafaring, world exploring, proto-capitalist Dutch burgers. Yes, in the 1920s, the Dutch planned, financed, and built not only Neva Amsterdam on Manhattan and Jakarta on the island of Java, but also Gothenburg here on the estuary of Jutta River. And their prototype and model was Amsterdam's well-known system of transporting canals. Today, we see rests of them on Manhattan, Canal Street, for instance, the Bowery in Jakarta, and even here in Gothenburg. With this introduction, I hope I've put Gothenburg into an understandable perspective. Hereafter, I will take long leaps, hop steps and jumps to guide you through it, uh, the centuries. And in the beginning of Gothenburg, that's 400 years ago, the city functioned as a Swedish stronghold against the still superior Danish arch enemy. The town was inhabited and led also by, by prosperous Dutch and Germans. <clears throat> The city moats and walls were supported by flanking forts in both east and west, and in the river estuary near Elfsborg, here outside, where we yesterday met Admiral Bellingshausen. Being the only Swedish port to the west, Gothenburg became a natural starting point for naval expeditions and adventures. The first one, with some perspective, was the task to establish a colony near Sverige, or New Sweden, on the American coast in today's Delaware. In the year 1637, two Dutch-built, always these Dutch, remember, <laughs> Dutch-built pinasses, rather heavily gunman merchant ships, the bigger one was called Kalmar and Nickel, uh, the smaller one, Vogelgrip, in all secrecy left the port of Gothenburg. Actually, Admiral Bellingshausen too, as you know, is Dutch-built. It's a Jongert motor sailing yacht from 1984. But in Gothenburg, some 400 years ago, uh, the colonists had loaded supplies and tough Finnish emigrants used to survive in wild forests to take them to the east coast of America. This westward mission had to be clandestine because it was threatening British as well as Dutch primary interests across the Atlantic. Nevertheless, it was partly Dutch financed and led by Peter Minui, who had been in Dutch service before and who was familiar with the areas around Delaware River, the goal of the expedition. Minui, by the, guy, uh, by the way, was a guy who bought Manhattan Peninsula from local natives for the worth of $24. An adventurer. Uh, Kalmar and Nickel uh, was 
commanded by another Dutchman, 27 years old, Jan van der Walter. And now to avoid British or Dutch attention, the course was set north of Scotland, but the ships ran into heavy storms and had to be repaired for a month in the Dutch port, and then the usual trade winds route uh, was good enough, regardless of possible dangers. To make this history short, the colony was established, supported, and refilled from the port of Gothenburg, of course. The Finns cleared, burned, and sowed the forests. They hunted and built blockhouses uh, like at home in Savalax. For some decades, the colony functioned quite well as a Swedish trading post. Nevertheless, in 1655, some decades later, it was taken over by the powerful Dutch neighbors led by legendary Peter Stuyvesant. If you're as old as I, you might have smoked Peter Stuyvesant's cigarettes. Yeah? No? But only nine years later, in uh, 1664, the even more powerful Brits grabbed uh, the colony from the Dutch. So it is to be underlined here that Nya Sverige, this colony, was regularly supported via Gothenburg. Kalmar and Nickel made four Atlantic crossings and was then, was then sold to, well, who? To the Dutch, of course. And now I jump to the 18th century. Uh, and I must... Uh, immediately start by disappointing our good Gothenburg patriots, because our own very own sea hero, popularly called Lasse i Gatan, ennobled Lars Gatanian, the king's Gothenburgian own privateer, is a legendary combatant of the Norwegian uh, Danish Admiral Peter Torenskjold. According to local tradition, the man, their man-to-man -man battles at sea took place outside the Utah River estuary, during the Great Nordic War, that is in the 1710s. Unfortunately, our Lasse was a TBC crippled and never fought a battle at sea himself. But he was a keen organizer and a strong wealth accumulator. True, his subordinates at sea totally captured some 80 Danish vessels, which is not bad. Uh, Lasse died young, 1718, and was succeeded by his wife, Ingela, and she showed to be an even shrewder organizing. The Gottingen's legacy in Gothenburg consists of these inspiring legends and a most representative 18th century building, uh, still spreading splendor at Stigbash Toyet. I go on. Contrary to Lasse Gata, the Swedish East India Company, founded here, 1731, was British, with British, Scottish, and Swedish capital and copied on the Dutch and British East India companies was a success story. The company managed 132 expeditions with 37 ships to Southeast Asia, Asia mostly China, Canton, but also to India, Madagascar, and Ceylon. And these ships looked exactly like the modern replica, Ostindifar and Göteborg, just outside this building. As one can imagine, this international big business brought <coughs> immense wealth to its company's Gothenburg shareholders. The accumulated capital was invested in the beginning industrialization of Sweden, especially in the iron, timber, and textile productions, also in this area. It is true that the Napoleonic Wars with the French continental blockade made an end to our East India Company, but on the other hand, the same blockade enabled gross smuggling from Gothenburg to industrializing England where there was an enormous and continuous need for iron and timber, the main products of Sweden. And uh, here in the area, they were mainly found in Värmland. And their mass exploitation and transport via Göta River to the port of Gothenburg now became based on British and Scottish investments and on the British and Scottish oligarchs that now settled in Gothenburg with their know-how, their networks, and family. Via the port of Gothenburg, they boosted the local and, and regional economy during decades. I'll just name some of the families which you Gothenburgians all know. For instance, the Barclays, the Campals, the Hall, Gunnebo, as you know, Carnegie, Porter, Pilsner, Dixon, Folkbiblioteket, Haga, Killer, Göteverken, Gibson, Junsirid, Chalmers, Matt, you know Chalmers, <laughs> to name some of them. As a result, uh, central Gothenburg still shows a clear 19th century impact. A very special chapter in this connection, the importance of the Gothenburg port, port in the 19th century is the Nordenfeld, Vega and Northeast Passage story. To make it short, 
Nordenschwelle's world-famous adventure was heavily financed also by the Gothenburg capitalist Oskar Dixon, and we were proud of that, of course. His expedition, in fact, started in Gothenburg, 1878. On the way northeast, it got stuck in the Arctic ice for 10 months, and before ending his triumphant voyage around the world in Stockholm uh, with the king, two years later, Nordenschwelle docked where he started, in Gothenburg. Here he was received as a true national hero by proud patrons, magistrate, and rejoicing masses. He made an enormous impact on the, on the Swedish contemporaries and for the image of enterprise in Sweden. And since then, we have Nordenfjöldsgatan and the Vegagatan, and also a home for the age called Vegahemmet in central Gothenburg. In the 19th century, Sweden experienced a strong country population increase followed by internal migration in the country, urbanization and industrialization. But the growing towns, growing towns and industries were not able to swallow the multiplying population masses. The solution for millions of Scandinavians, like for Germans and Irish before them, and Italians, Jews and East Europeans after them was immigration, mainly to America. After a slow start, also the immigration process became industrialized. And as one can imagine, the port of Gothenburg became the gate to the west for hundreds of thousands of immigrants. The result of these developments was the founding of new shipping companies, big shipyards and docks and regular shipping across the Atlantic. Amongst the Gothenburg shipping companies, one has to mention AB Transatlantic, Svenska Amerika Linjen, Svenska Orient Linjen, Svenska Lloyd and Svenska Ostasiatska Company. No surprise, both supercapitalist uh, Wallenberg and the, Brustrom and the Brustrom families became deeply involved in these businesses. On the northern side of Jöta River, the Eriksberg, right where we are, uh, Lindholmen and above all Jöta Merkin shipyards and docks started to gain competence, reputation and wealth. They employed thousands of engineers, clerks and blue collar labor decade after decade. The heyday of the Gothenburg shipping and shipyarding systems was maintained far into the 1950s and 60s. And this was a situation I met as a young boy in the beginning of the 1950s as I waved goodbye to the Estonians leaving for America. Then after that, as you know, uh, grow growing and even exploding Southeast and Asian competition became overwhelmingly strong for, for the Gothenburg enterprises. I will now narrow the perspective and return to more Estonian Gothenburg maritime matters. Parallel to the regular Estonian re-immigration from Sweden around 1950, which we already mentioned, there is a largely forgotten story about the post-war flight of hundreds of Swedish Estonians and other boys. Having no official papers and mistrusting Swedish officials, they sneaked out from the protective archipelago around Gothenburg here and headed mainly for USA for freedom, as it was proclaimed. Enterprising Estonian refugees in Sweden had put together their last kronor and öre uh, to organize boat partnerships and to purchase some old hulks. During long nights and weekends, they worked uh, the boats into almo almost seaworthy conditions, bought equipment, planned the trip, found suitable captains and crews, and decent paying passengers. And this altogether could take months, even years. And then, from the late 1945 on, actually, they sailed away westwards to face the unknown. Of course, ships went missing. The reason, <coughs> the reason for these adventures was a deep mistrust in Swedish official foreign policy towards the Soviet Union, the so-called Kriegewegen, the assumed third way. Another Important preconditions for the undertakings were good jobs and salaries here in Gothenburg, mainly as at the big shipyards here around, like Eriksberg. And the income was then increased with wages for black construction work at nights and weekends and so on. And finally, thirdly, the wide Gothenburg archipelago with its many, many small harbors and its old sailors with wide knowledge of the seven seas was a perfect area to hide any clandestine enterprise as it was most uh, suitable also to sneak out from. The Atlantic was then mainly crossed via the canneries, 
and the trade winds uh, during weeks and weeks in mostly overloaded, tiny, worn-out fishing boats and sailboats, and later in somewhat larger motor steamers. Captain Yuri Vendla in Hapsalo has identified 17 voyages between 1945 and 51 to the USA. And Dr. Jutta Kitching of Vancouver found 11 vessels from Sweden landing in Canada, mostly in Halifax. <clears throat> Seven boats left from Sweden for Argentina, six left for South Africa, only, only three made it, with a total of 71 people on board. And now, an example of all this, to finish off my presentation. Captain Johannes Wurman from Nidiotza farm on southern Sarema had earned his boat money in the Jonesed uh, factories close to Gothenburg and by nightly construction work. In the summer of 1948, with uh, uh, another 14 people on board, he crossed the Atlantic with his 37 feet MS Roland. Because he didn't have any correct uh, ID papers, he on purpose set his ship on the rocks outside Southport, North Carolina. However, the crew was luckily landed, the wreck sold, and Verman with his uh, 14 friends were sent off to US immigration on Ellis Island. This was the usual pattern. From there, the immigrants were to be spread all over the country to make a living of their own, to support themselves, etc. An immigration officer vehemently tried to find out what jobs these Estonians might be suited for. And he tested the workers, said, who knows anything about shrimps? And without even having heard the word before, there are no shrimps in Estonian waters, Captain Johannes Verman jumped to his feet and firmly stated, Ay, and August too. In that way, the Vermans, including Captain John's compatriot, August from Sarema landed in Brownsville, Texas, on the Mexican Gulf. These Estonians quickly grasped the situation, worked hard, organized, were clever, and eventually made a fortune on fishing shrimp. In short, they became filthy rich and didn't even know what to do with their heaps of money. Some dec decades later, Vermans possessed an armada of 40 shrimping vessels all of them sailing the Mexican Gulf under the Estonian blue, black, white colors. And remember, Captain John set out from the port of Gothenburg. That's my point. But the story goes on. In the meantime, Captain John's young nephew, Pavel, Pavel Verman, had remained in Gothenburg. He went to school here, grew up here. And after his uncle passed away in Texas, among other precious things, Pavo inherited his uncle's golden Rolex wristwatch, which Pavo just now is carrying in the Verman family's old farm on Nidiotsa farm on Sarema. It's Captain John's birthplace. It's in fact situated just a few kilometers south of today's heroes, Fabian von Bellingshausen's birthplace, Lachetagose, or Lachetage in German. Lachetage is a manor. So, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. If you start, into look, start looking into history, you will find that everything is more or less connected. And as I have tried to show, they are connected by the port of Gothenburg. With this statement, I want to round off my presentation, which focused on the role of uh, the Gothenburg Harbor, but also naturally, since we regard Fabian von Bellingshausen as an Estlander, as one of our own, uh, the presentation also had to deal with some very special Estonian ex aspects of this matter. Thank you for listening.